Welcome back from your break, everyone. I hope you all are feeling nourished and rejuvenated as we head into the last part of our day. I cannot believe Tuesday's almost over. And I have had such a great Tuesday from attending and just getting out of the Facebook candidate track and learning about the importance of standing up and standing out. That was so powerful to me, as well as all the other amazing breakout tracks. So thank you to everyone who organized those and participated. And I am now so excited and honored to introduce Bushra Amiwala, who currently serves on the Skokie School Board. I remember watching her TED Talk back in 2019, which was called Why You Can't Afford to Wait, and just feeling her bold passion, her authenticity, her commitment to making our political space one where all people are truly heard and valued through my computer screen. So I'm fanning out a little bit right now. Um, and so thank you, Trulri Busha, for your vision, your light, and your mission. And for all the participants, please feel free to fire up the chat box with any questions or hyping up during this amazing keynote. So take it away, Busha. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much, Julia, for that lovely introduction. That was so, so sweet, and that means a ton. I'm so incredibly excited to be here today as a keynote speaker. Thank you to Ignite for hosting such valuable sessions for young women who seek to want to run for office. My name is Bushra Amiwala. I currently serve on the Board of Education for Skokie School District 73 and a half. And in April 2019, I went down in the Chicago History Museum as the youngest Muslim elected official in the United States. I also carry the title of being the first Muslim person elected to my board and the first hijab wearing elected official in the state of Illinois. My campaigns for public office made national headlines from Forbes to Bloomberg to The Hill and even graced me on the cover of Time magazine. So before I delve into that journey, my story is incomplete without sharing my dad's story first. My father came to the United States from Karachi, Pakistan in the 80s at the age of 18 with $20 in his pocket and an abundance of dreams. He worked extremely hard to make ends meet and worked every job from bussing tables to flipping burgers to delivering pizzas to driving a taxi to later owning his own clothing store on the west side of Chicago called Chicago Style. My dad grew up in an extremely under-resourced neighborhood and faced struggles of poverty, hunger, lack of homelessness, and also things of that sort. And these issues became a guiding principle for me and influenced the core tenets I place and hold value to today. So with my father's journey and struggle in mind, at the age of 13, I found myself volunteering at five different nonprofit organizations five days of the week. However, as I grew older, I realized that nonprofit work is only part of the solution and that the best way to make long-term practical change is through public policy. And this theme came up with every single organization I worked with and cared about. For example, I am extremely passionate about the issue of hunger. I saw the way hunger impacted my peers in school, heard stories from my dad when he lived in Pakistan. So I began working with a just harvest an organization where I had the pleasure and privilege of giving a hot plate of food to every person who walked in through the door, regardless of their socioeconomic background or who they were. And I had many conversations while volunteering here. For example, everyone wanted to hear about my hijab, why I began wearing it, and why I had to wear a hairnet on top of my hijab. It was just the policy. And many patrons noted how I was the first Muslim person they met and how meeting me was able to diminish predisposed beliefs they held for people like me. And that stuck with me. So after spending almost two years at a just harvest and noticing the same people I served food to every single day, I asked one of the organizers that this is such a temporary solution to the issue of hunger. How can we make sure that the 300 people we serve today don't need us? We can't just keep helping them day after day, but we must tackle the long-term problem at its source. The organizer smiled, gave me an address, and the following week I began working with Northside Power, an organization that tackled the political side of hunger, where he worked with legislative canvassing, went door to door, and told the residents at the um, residents to vote for a referendum on the bottom of the ballot to help increase funding they'd receive in monthly food stamp benefits. 
And this sort of epiphany is one that became relevant with every organization I worked with. When I worked with Starfish Learning, I remember being bothered by the idea of an after-school program that just tutored a selective group of students in their classes, because this was not going to solve the issue of educational inequality at large. And how there was an overarching solution that has to impact all students. I remember sharing this concern with the teacher I worked with at the time, who laughed and said, well, you should go into politics to do something like that then. But there was this mutual consensus that politicians are corrupt, dishonest, untrustworthy, and for some reason, everyone would say this about politicians, but also be okay with and accept this notion as it is what it is. So you see, I never directly worked on a campaign or followed my state representative around or could tell you what the difference between what a trustee and a mayor does. But it wasn't until my senior year of high school when I took an AP government and politics class and for the first time had conversations about politics with my peers and friends at the time and realized a lot of my friends would be voting for Donald Trump to be president, which is something that didn't make sense to me because I they were friends with a Muslim woman. Um, and at the time, Trump and the Republican Party was spewing anti-Islamic and anti-hate rhetoric. But I also realized that I didn't actually understand what people from the Republican Party cared about and what it meant to be a Republican. So I want to get a firsthand look at what it meant to be Republican and decided to work for the most powerful Republican in the state of Illinois, our U.S. Senator at the time, Senator Mark Kirk. And through his campaign, I decided to be a field intern because as a field intern, I know my job would be to go door to door to various registered Republican voters' homes and ask them a series of five questions. And I wouldn't have to tell a single person to vote for Mark Kirk. So I'm on this campaign about um, just graduated high school, you know, about to be a freshman in college. And I find that the first question on that list that I have to ask when going door to door is on a scale of one to 10, how fearsome are you of an Islamic terror attack on US soil? And that was the first question I had to ask. And I remember the responses would be eight or above across the board to the point where I inserted question number 1.5, which was why? Because when else will I have the opportunity to talk to someone who not only fundamentally disagrees with me, but is scared of me? And every time I would ask why, someone would say, well, you're the first Muslim person I've ever met which happened three miles from my home. So that probably was not true, but I maybe was the first seemingly Muslim person that someone had met and that stuck with me. And they, ch and I went back to the Mark Kirk's office and asked my fellow interns, you know, why do I keep getting the answer eight or above? Like, why are people so scared of this? And where does this anti-Islamic sentiment come from? And I found that my peer shared, well, Bushra, if these people's perception comes from the media, can you blame them? Can you find a positive representation of Muslims in the media? Which I took as a challenge, but ultimately after much soul searching and digging, I found that Muslims in the media were either represented as the perpetrators of violence or the victims of violence. And that every time a Muslim was presented as a, as a hero in the media, they were brought down 10 notches before they could rise five. And with all of that in mind, it was someone on the Mark Kirk's campaign that saw leadership ability and potential in me that I definitely do not see in myself at the time. And they asked me to run for office. I was 19, a freshman in college, had a plethora of reasons to not do something like this, but a small voice in my head said, well, why not? And it is very hard to imagine yourself in a space where there isn't someone who already looks like you there represented. And this was in March of 2017. So ignorance is bliss because I had no idea what I was getting myself into and ended up running against a 16 year Democratic incumbent who was quite the seasoned politician. Through my campaign for the Cook County Board of Commissioners, I mobilized hundreds of volunteers, electrified thousands of first time voters, and my campaign resulted in a historical voter turnout. And I made national headlines, but alas, I still lost. And it's quite challenging to focus on all the excitement and positives in a situation like this 
but a week after my election, I got breakfast with the person I ran against, and he encouraged me to run for office again. This time, I decided to run for the Board of Education in my hometown in a crowded race of seven people, and in April 2019, I got elected. And I wouldn't be where I am today if it wasn't for the support of other women in my life. My mentors have played a pivotal role in my journey. And my ask to all of you today is what are you waiting to do? What is one thing you want to do? And please don't wait for the right time because that time does not exist. We make the right time for ourselves. I ran for public office despite my insecurities and limiting beliefs. And just remember, doing things in spite of your insecurities makes that thing all the more impressive. So be a change agent in your community, rally for issues you care about, and you too should run for office. Thank you. Should I um, just start the questions or Julia, will you read them out loud? Oh my goodness. Well, first of all, thank you for that testimony. We make the right times for ourselves. I mean, that just... And asking ourselves why not, there's always this, you know, instinct to make excuses and justifications, but we need to silence that part of our brain and instead listen to what's inside of us, our passion to make change. So thank you for that wonderful testimony. The first question is, as a Muslim elected official, how do you handle others using your religion and beliefs to compromise your identity? So that's a really good question. Um, I guess by like compromising my identity, I think by that, that means um, people not being, it's the inability to see beyond my religious identity is what I'm assuming that that question means, right? Okay, cool. Sounds good. I uh, just wanted to make sure I was answering it accurately. So what I found was people oftentimes ask me that I have ageism, racism, sexism, and Islamophobia all working against me in congruence. And that's what intersectionality basically yes. is. And people sometimes ask, you know, which do you think impacted you the most? And I definitely think that sexism was the greatest of that. But with that being said, as women, we tend to be reduced to our clothing and our appearances. And as a Muslim woman who wears a hijab, being reduced to my identity means the inability to see beyond my religious beliefs. So with all of that in mind, um, I think sometimes people were obsessed with talking about my religious identity and my Muslim identity and faith, which is something I take a great deal of pride in, but I felt as though that was almost hijacked from me. So for example, I had a debate between my two male opponents and I, and in that debate, there was a news article highlighting this debate because it was quite notable. There were a lot of people that showed up to see it. And this news article says the two policy ideas that each male opponent presented, and it said, and Bushra Amiwala wore a stylish light pink hijab to the forum. And that's all it said about me. And that's, in my opinion, what this question is sort of getting at. Like, how do you handle other people um, using your religion to comp like to compromise my identity? Like, that's the main thing that people sort of focused on. And um, people talking about my identity went far beyond that, too. So, for example, I was offered $54,500 worth of corporate PAC funding which I declined because it was not in line with my values. And I remember posting a Facebook video of myself sharing this news that I was offered this large sum of money and that I declined it. So power to the people, like everyone donate money to my campaign now, right? Like used it as that tactic. And I remember I got a lot of messages from people saying, could you lighten the lipstick next time? Um, and I wish I could, you know, be here in front of you all and share the very inspiring, sassy remark I gave back. But as a part, as a young Muslim woman, I was very hyper aware of my identity. And I knew that any justified response I would give would either be attributed to my age. Oh, my God, Bashar Amiwala is so young and immature. How could she have said that? Or my gender. Wow, her hormones must be whack. It's probably the time of the month. Um, so I never wore that lipstick again. But um, I don't want anything to distract from my messaging or campaign, especially my identity. So thank you for that question. That was an amazing answer. We have another, we have so many questions flooding the chat box um, and, and so, um, so much just encouragement. So thank you so much again for sharing that. The next question is, how did you run at such a young age? What motivated you? Yeah, that is such a good question. Um, so like I said, 
How was because I was at five different nonprofits the five days of the week and found that the best way to make long term tactical change is through public policy. So that's what really motivated me. It was to take the nonprofit work that I was doing to the next level, to the political level, because as I mentioned sort of in my remarks, that the best way to make long term practical change is through public policy. So my motivation comes from my dad's story, right? Like the issues that impacted him, educational inequality, poverty, food insecurity. Those are the core tenets that I am so grateful that these things are what things that never impacted me in that direct of a manner. So it's always that sort of style of humanity that's always motivated me. And running at a young age, I'll admit, I think a lot of people didn't realize how young I actually was when they would see me and meet me. I think I wear like quite a bit of makeup and then I like talk a certain way and I double dotted my eyes and triple crossed my T's to make sure that I that people wouldn't know that I was 19 while doing so. But I also think that my story is a testament to you can do this too at a young age. There's a reason why the age to run for a lot of offices is only 18. Um, because if, if you can, yeah. So I think it's always important to call that out as well. So uh, the way that I did it, also the secret sauce is that network, network, and network. Um, my network was really, my networking like skills and ability and all of that is truly what I think set me apart as a candidate. And I was able to rely on those people to help open doors for me and pave the way for me. Yes. And as a 20 year old sitting here, I know sometimes I face this imposter syndrome and and try to come up with excuses. But sometimes all we need is that push because we and this is something the Ignite community really focuses on. We have lived experiences and perspectives that we can bring to the table and and need to be directing the policy because we need to be heard. Um, and I absolutely love how your father's experiences have really shaped your vision. We have another question. Um, as an atheist who respects all beliefs and religions, do you think that my own belief should be should perhaps be minimized in the public eye, or is there a way to try and subvert the current narrative in that case as well? That is a really good question, and I'll be honest, it's one I've never been asked before, so take my opinion with a grain of salt, because uh, I'm no political expert by any means, but I will say that your personal beliefs should not dictate the way people view you in politics. What should are your policies, your values, your moral compass? And if that's influenced by being an atheist, then take pride in that. Then showcase, you know, like the reason why I have these beliefs is because of X, Y, and Z. And if you think there's no correlation between the two, then perhaps you can separate that from your identity. But I think the call is truly yours. What I would not want is for anyone else's perception or view of what your beliefs are to dictate what you choose to stand for and what you choose to identify with in a public manner of something of that sort. Yes, that and, and that kind of ties into the next question. Do identity politics have a role in our communities and running for a position or have you found it to be counterproductive? And um, it, I have seen many young people rely on their aesthetic phenotypical typical identity to get funding, et cetera. You know, I have seen it be a double-edged sword. sword. Um, I've seen the way that identity politics has helped me get national attention, right? Mm -hmm. By identity politics, I mean, people focusing on the fact that I'm a Muslim woman. But I also see that that's all people focused on to the point where they forgot about what my policies actually were. And as a candidate running for office, what matters more than your values, right? And I think that um, what I also find is that some people rely solely on their identity to get votes and support. And I think that that's inappropriate. I think that there is so much more to us than our identities, but our identities caveat our experiences and ca and the way that our, it, it shapes the way that we view the world and interact and engage with people in society. And that's why people's respective identities being different is a thing because diversity is about faces but inclusion is about voices and your voice is what sets you apart, right? Your voice is what were inherently your values. Like I mentioned earlier, your moral compass, your beliefs, your policy stances, ideas, all of that comes to the table. And, you know, I've, I've gotten some pushback from people. Well, you know, you, for example, what there's this other, like, let's say, um, young Muslim woman running in a different state, right? Like, could you support her? Had a conversation with her on the phone. Turns out she's pro-gun. I'm not pro-gun. 
right? That is a stance that I have very firmly and believe on. And I think there should be stricter gun regulation. Sorry if this is too political for this conversation. But for me, that's a value that I was not personally aligned with. So I did not support this young woman's campaign. And people, and I feel like that identity politics factor, I was accused of like not supporting someone of my own kind. And I think that's inappropriate too. So there's a really fine line between that. And I see the double-edged sword. And I think that... Um, there's a reason why we value diverse voices and faces, but we have to remember that what's coming out of our mouth matters significantly more than that as well. Yes, yes, yes to everything you have said. And Bushra, thank you so much um, for your boldness, your vision, your energy, and your passion and joy for not only being a leader, but also bringing up other people with you. I know I felt that. Um, today and also watching and reading about you. Um, and thank you for telling everyone on this call, yes, you can. Uh, this was such a wonderful way to wrap up today and getting connect to connect with you was such a dream for me and I will remember this testimony. So thank you so much. You are so sweet, Julia. Thank you all so much for your questions. I loved engaging and interacting. My socials are at Bushra Amiwala. So keep in touch. I'd love to hear from you all. I try to be super like responsive and accessible. So feel free to reach out. And thank you all very much for having me today. Thank you. Ah. Ah. <laughs> Smiling so good right now. I'm all speechless. <laughs> oh my gosh how was that julia if i could have told myself like you know <laughs> in in 2019 when i was watching her ted talk and reading articles that you would get to talk to bushra Miwali, well amawala in um a year i would have been like really and i am so grateful for this experience so i'm so grateful for her attending this conference ah i'm just beaming that made my I day know, if we could jump up and down i would but that mm -hmm. would not work out in this particular angle in this particular moment but That's i am jumping conference. up and down with all of you <laughs> Um, what a phenomenal day two. We are um, two thirds um, complete with the conference. Um, I'm just curious from folks, um, if you can drop in the chat box, the emoji that you feel in this particular moment um, of what you've experienced thus far today. Let's see what the emojis look like. Ooh. I like that emoji, Jesse. Star eyes, yes. Cherries. And now I'm, oh, we've got a mind blown one. Ooh, there's unicorns, my favorite animal. These are so fun. I just realized that you could put emojis in the chat box. So thank you for flooding the chat box with all of these newfound things that I've just discovered. Um, perfect. Well, we, I mean, there's lots of highlights today. I was bouncing around to all of the different places. And um, the thing that is really top of mind for me is the community board panel um, and really thinking about how do we um, navigate the community board process so that we can be commissioners um, all across the country. And I think that there are some really big pieces there that I wrote on my little <laughs> three by five card because who still has three by five cards except for myself. <laughs> um, but one of the things that um, our Baltimore fellow um, said in there was meet yourself where you are. Um, and I think one of the things that Bushra had just talked about is like, there's never going to be a perfect time, a perfect moment, a perfect, you know, specific day of the year, X, Y, or Z for us to really think about when is this the right time for us to step up as political leaders. Um, and tis the season for the theme of our conference. The time is now, everyone. The time is now. Um, and so that really resonates with me and really thinking about how do I continue to meet myself, but how do each of us figure out how to meet where Sarah is, where Julia P is, where Aaron is, where Elizabeth is, where Anna is um, on this particular day and this particular part of our journey. What are your key takeaways, Julia P? Oh my gosh, so many. <laughs> I enjoyed all the tracks today. I'm so glad I get got to like go into each and every one of them. And I think again, just kind of echoing what you said, this constant 
theme of the time is now and and recognizing that within ourselves our lived experiences our perspectives our backgrounds matter that's qualification mm -hmm. and and realizing those and being confident in those is is all we need to show up and serve our communities is that passion and so to be in spaces like these where we feel open and and able to express those those backgrounds and those perspectives and then getting amazing women who have done it telling us yes you can i think is just the most empowering thing that you can experience and so i just feel so humbled and so grounded and ah it was just a, a beautiful day truly beautiful and i think any other word would do it injustice <laughs> I know there are not enough words um, to describe the joy of each of the different moments today. Um, the other thing that I just thought about as you were saying that, Rai said in the last panel that when she was um, writing for her application for her commission, she actually front and center at the very top talked about how old she was. Um, and so I think that a lot of us have probably all the different thoughts about what does it mean to be young and stepping into the to being the version of the political leader that we're going to be. And I think our age is actually going to be a much more of a stronghold than it is going to be a deterrent um, in us um, just not only applying, but taking on these different roles all across our communities in this country. Um, well, I'm super excited for tomorrow because we are gonna wrap up um, three days of Young Women Run. Um, we will have one more round of those breakout sessions to close the loop for our phenomenal five different tracks. Um, and then we are going to hear from Representative Lauren Underwood. I'm super excited about her keynote tomorrow. So you will all get to enjoy some time with her. Um, and then we are gonna wrap all of this up and all of the learning um, and all of this excitement and joy um, with our call to action. Um, and you all have met our um, phenomenal Chief Program Officer, Tiara Stewart, but you will get reintroduced to her um, on the main stage tomorrow so that um, she can tell you what's coming next for us here at Ignite in terms of programs. So I think those are the key pieces. Um, did we miss anything, Julia P? I think you've got it all. I am so excited for tomorrow. I'm sad it's going to be over, but I know tomorrow we'll just, you know, we'll continue to learn from each other, be in community, and I cannot wait to hear from Representative Lauren Underwood and Tiara, who always speak so much life and truth. Yeah, get as much note pages out ready for tomorrow because I know you're all furiously writing just as much as I am in all of the notebooks and note cards. <laughs> I have no cards. Um, and so I think you're all probably wondering, we'll end our time with humor today. Why do I call Julia P. Julia P.? That's so, like, who does that? That is so random. Um, well, we have two Julias in our current cohort of fellows. We have a Julia JS and a Julia P. And so um, that is the way that I figured out exactly how to navigate the two of them as they were onboarding last summer. And so we'll leave that, we'll leave you all with that super random fun fact. And we'll see everybody tomorrow. We kick off at 10.30 Pacific, 12.30 CST, and 1.30 EST. So we'll see you all then. Thank you. Thank you. See you all tomorrow. Bye.